Welcome back to another episode of The Bourbon Lens. This is Jake along with Scott. And today, grab your readers or your cheaters or, you know, if you just have a good set of eyes. We're going to open up a book today and we're going to be talking to two people that know a lot about whiskey and a lot about brands and their upcoming book that they have coming out. Today, joining The Bourbon Lens, we have Stephen Grass, who is the founder of Quaker City Mercantile and the creator of Hendrix Gin, Sailor Jerry Rum, Arts in the Age Spirits, and Tamworth Distilling, among many others, from a brand perspective, as well as Aaron Goldfarb, who is a novelist, author, and journalist who frequently writes about the spirits industry and drinking culture for the New York Times, Esquire, Punch, and Vine Pair. So guys, that was a mouthful. And you all are probably some of the most distinguished guests that we've ever had on here. So thank you for joining the Bourbon Lens. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. So uh, we are on the precipice of some big things coming out here for you all in the coming days for your new book uh, that's going to be Brand Mysticism. So how are you all feeling about the the launch of this here very, very soon? Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very excited about it. I think it's a... <laughs> It's a surprisingly good book, and I owe all of that to Aaron Goldfarb, who uh, patiently spent almost all of COVID with me weekly, remotely, talking about this. So this this was our COVID project. Everyone's got to have one, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't baking bread like everyone else during COVID. No, it was, it was baking. Uh, uh, tall tales and, and spinning yarns. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, what's it like? Just, I, I think what's really interesting here, what's it like getting two creative minds? One, like, you know, Aaron, you're structured and you're trying to write and, and, you know, Steven, you're focused on this big creative, like where's the, the synergy, but also the clash that comes with these two unique type of personalities and, and really ultimate objective that you all are trying to create. I'll let Aaron answer that one. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're, the thing is, how do you wrangle an entire life and career into, you know, whatever, 250 pages? And, uh, you know, if you're writing about a baseball player, I'm sure you start with day one and just go to the end of his career. But with, you know, someone who's created all these great brands, who's, you know, started in uh you know things outside the whiskey industry hawking cigarettes you know coming up with some of the first sneaker drops in history for puma you know there's a lot of stuff to include you don't want it just to be a boring book of uh, you know life lessons and stuff uh so you want so you know i wanted to design it as part memoir because steve has some of the craziest stories you've ever heard um, and then, you know, indeed life lessons and branding lessons and marketing lessons and, and maybe some uh, crazy stories as well. You have to kind of go through the crazy, yeah. you have to go through the crazy stories to get to the branding lessons because mm. they, yeah. they don't make sense otherwise. Right. So I think that's one of the things I like about this, this uh, book. It's not a, it's not a business book as they tend to be where it's like step one, step two. It's, it is somewhat of a memoir. It's kind of like a mashup, right, of, uh, of, of, of styles. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about it for me. And I also think the way it's written, uh, again, thanks to Aaron, is, is it's very readable. It's not like um, – it's, it's barely a marketing book. It's more like a – I don't know. It's like a what-the-fuck book it's in a good way, in a good way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I thought it was a, a super easy read, and uh, it's just fascinating because all of your stories are are linked to each other in some form or fashion, and I think Aaron really captured how those are linked. Yeah, you know, because I kept imagining, you know, when I was reading this book, if you took the names of the of the brands out of the book and you started just describing like what the campaigns were, you could insert the names on your own. Yeah, that, that, and that's great. That 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 means the brands are successful if you know what they are, based on the description of the world that that they live in, as opposed to uh, the brand name name itself. Except for the one about uh, Red Camel, but that's just because I don't think I was really uh, up to snuff on that type of marketing at that time. But uh, yeah. yeah, well, and you know, cigarettes. We always say cigarettes. We call it the marketing Marine Corps. Hmm. 
because that's where we learned how to get the word out about something when you're not allowed to get the word out about something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, and that's where that's, and that's how me and Aaron actually first met was he did an article for Vine Pair about how to make a booze brand go viral. And we talked, it was, you know, about Sailor Jerry and, and how we did that. And that's when we, uh, we had a great time um, during that interview. And a lot of it was about the stuff we learned in the, in the cigarette business, um, which is, you know, the toughest job you'll ever love. It's like, you know, and I guess down in Kentucky, you guys kind of know that. Um, it's related. It's all related. And uh, I, I just like not being in cigarettes now because now everyone doesn't hate me mm. the way they used to be. They hate me for other reasons, but not for cigarettes. <laughs> well, I mean, you say that it's really interesting because like growing up, right? Um, like in my lifetime, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm younger, but like the Marlboro man used to have this big billboard, like right down a main thoroughfare, thoroughfare in Louisville and Breckenridge lane. And like for years, just ride by it. And it would just be the Marlboro bill, Marlboro billboard. But like, yep. it was cool because it was this dude on a Bronco, like smoking a cigar or a cigarette with his hat, a cowboy hat on. And you're like, man, the Marlboro man looks pretty cool. And like, he would so it's really interesting how those two kind of are similar, but different because, you know, the usage of cigarettes like has been linked to so many negative things, alcohol, not as many, but obviously there's, there's some, some side effects. If you consume too much, that's why everyone says drink responsibly. Um, so I, I, I find that to be an interesting yeah, but parallel. You know what cigarettes taught me is when you talk about the Marlboro man is, um, uh, a great brand is transportive mm. in the sense that what you saw with, you know, come to Marlboro country was for every time you lit that cigarette, you wanted to be the Marlboro man. You wanted to be there in that, you know, mountaintop in Aspen or whatever you were. Mm. Um, you know, the funny story of how we got Camel as a client was we wrote a letter to the uh, CEO of, of RJ Reynolds and just said, Joe Camel is the best anti-smoking campaign of all time. And they, it, it really got them, they got their back up and they called the uh, the CEO's assistant called and said, "Boy, you better get on down here," because they were fighting mad about that. But ended up, I walked out of there with a, you know, an amazing project to create a new cigarette brand, mm. which we called Red Camel. And it was like, you know, sometimes it pays to be, you know, kind of a to write people that that, that letter was designed to be provocative and and you know whatever, and it worked. So anyway. No, I think that's super interesting. And and I think that's what like graphs me during just like reading through the book. But like it was the visuals that allowed me as, as a non-reader to be engaged in the reading, like the illustrative part along with the writing make this to be someone who like myself, who's not a, a super big reader, connect with the marketing side of that because I, I create, I understand brands, I understand concepts. And so seeing those pictures yeah. allowed for, you know, a non-reader reader to connect with the book in, in a different way different way. So that's what I found just unique right off the bat. You know, fun fact, the guy who uh, designed the book and did all the graphics, he's the same art director who created the Hendrix bottle and brand world. He's been with me for 30 years and he also did Sailor Jerry. So he's a, he's a design genius. He's always been, has always worked at my side. And, um, and I, I specifically wanted him to design the book because I wanted it to feel like the brand we're most famous for. So, mm. no, I think that makes a lot of sense. And so Aaron, like you have the, the stories, like you said, that the, all this creative genius, like how do you start to, you know, you whiteboard all of this. How do you start to bring that concept together for readers to start to understand like the, the bits and pieces and, and interweaving the, the story together? You know, I think one of my challenges was when, you know, you're a certain type of genius like Steve, the way things work are inherent in your brain. So it can be hard to elucidate them to a layman audience. So I was constantly having to coax out of him, you know, how did you understand, you know, inherently what to do here? You know, the, the tent poles of the book were obviously going to kind of be Hendrix and Sailor Jerry, which were his biggest, which are his biggest uh, hits and were created the same week back in 1999, I think, and are, are both very different types of, of, you know, spirits. Hendrix was the first real craft gen. It's a real connoisseurial product. Sailor Jerry is obviously more of a, 
a, a party type product that, um, you know, not something I've ever really drank, but I might have if it was introduced when I was in college. <laughs> so, you know, and that's the thing is, is, you know, not a one trick pony that's constantly coming up with the same idea. You know, he's got a wide swath of things he's created, some more successful than others. You know, he's branched into to beer and whatnot. And, you know, I think he's doing some of his most interesting work now at uh, Tamworth Distilling up in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. which we can talk about if you'd like. Yeah. So, so Scott, like, you know, you're, you said you want to talk about Hendrix. So here's, here's your opportunity from a tent to perspective and Aaron set you up really well here, you know, like what drew you to Hendrix from a, a gin drinking perspective, like just as a consumer? I mean, really it, it was the thing that kind of drew me to gin in general was how unique it could be. Hmm. And, you know, in college, when I started drinking gin, it was, it was kind of just, it was a weird thing that I did with another buddy who decided to pick up and start drinking gin as well, instead of drinking, you know, vodka and cheap whiskeys and beer, uh, natural light, things like that. We just started ordering different gins at bars. And, and this is one that sat on, on the back bar and it's unique. It's got that apothecary type bottle. Like obviously the label is it's, it's art in, a, in and of itself. But it's a little bit mysterious, too, because it's a blacked out bottle. You have no clue, even though it's gin and you know it's clear. Uh, you really don't know what's in the bottle. It's just black. So it was really just just discovery, just trying to discover something different, something new. Mm. And all gins look the same on the shelf. You know, the classic, whether it was Beefeater or uh, Gilby's Gin or Gordon's Gin, you know, any of those are just typical gin bottles. So this one was the one that kind of stuck out. So like Steve, as, as he talks about like that, like in the Hendrix bottle sticks out, like how do you, from a creative side, put together this, you know, how do we stand out? How do we, how are we different? Like, do you first have to sample the product? Do you, you know, like what's your creative process behind if you can take us back to 1999 when this is created, like how did you get those creative juices flowing to start, you know, building this iconic gin? I think it's a great story. So um, we had uh, back in the day when we were, you know, big tobacco with R.G. Reynolds, we only had two other clients. One was uh, Puma, which mm. was still tiny, right? And then the other client was, uh, we started doing work for William and Grant, William Grant and Sons. And we did a U.S. campaign for Glenn Fittick. And uh, a guy by the name of Mark Teasdale said, create a gin and a rum for our portfolio. So I didn't know anything about either, but he said, I want you to go to Scotland with Sir Charles Gordon Graham, who is the man. And he, he wanted to show me his gin palace. And I'm thinking like, Ooh, a palace. Right. So we go to Gervin, Scotland, and there's a, a literally a concrete bunker. And inside of these two ancient stills, uh, Carter and the Bennett still Carter. And, uh, they're from like the 1840s. And I'm like, wow, this looks like Jules Verne, right? Yeah. And and that's the way, I mean, it's really that simple. Jules Verne. And I'm like, and then he tells me like, well, how, I'm like, I don't even know how gin's made, right? He tells me about the basket and you can put the tentacles in it. I'm like, so it's getting, it's getting this idea of like apothecary, right? So, and then it's like a stream of consciousness. So the way I, I think about things, it's like, okay, Jules Verne, 1870s, which is when Grass was founded. And then Victorian apothecary, poison bottles. And so um, I send out my assistant, Rona, who's now the president of my company. I sent her to uh, antique shops and she found poison, old poison bottles, right? And one of them was this, and the reason I said poison, it wasn't meant to be poison. It's just like old apothecary bottles from Victorian you know, era. And uh, so the Hendrix gin bottle was literally a, a Victorian poison bottle that was tiny and we just blew it up to proportion. So things like, um, so it just starts a stream of consciousness. And then you start thinking like, okay, so you've got like uh, the Jules Verne, um, Pothecary, and uh, no budget because they're Scottish and the Scots never have a budget. So, <laughs> um, so we start playing with this sort of like Monty Python-esque uh, Victorian woodcuts, right? Cutting and pasting them together because we don't have even money to do a photo, photo shoot of any kind. And then, um, you know, 
the idea with the the cucumber and, and rose petal is like um, I'm I'm the cucumber guy because I I uh, my ex wife now ex wife um, was from New Zealand and she was really into Pim's cups. So when Mark Teasdale said, "What's the call for the for the brand?" and I said, "Well, what like what, what's the serve? What's the call?" and I was like, "Well, let, let's put a cucumber in it, right?" So we that became a signature thing for the brand. So it's all kind of this like stream of consciousness. So like the dark glass happy accident ends up being this thing that makes the brand very unique. We only ever did one focus group on Hendrix. And um, we put the bottle in the middle of the table with like, you know, 12 people around it. Everyone sat up very intently, looked at the bottle. And then the moderator said, what do you think? And they all said, we hate it. And to Mark Teasdale's credit, he said, did you see the way they reacted when that was put on the table? They hate it now, but they're going to love it. And then we just went with it. And, and I think, you know, back then too, Grants was a far, much more smaller company. So we just kind of ran with things. And I, I'm, I'm a big fan of in-market testing. So you just kind of put it out there and see what happens. Mm. And we put it out there and not much happened for the longest time, right? The U.S. had kind of bumped along. I think we were in San Francisco at first. So a lot of, the brand launched in the U.S. first. But it wasn't until in the UK that um, we had a really good event agency. I can't remember what their name was, but they had the idea to bring the weird brand world that we created with the, the cutouts and things like that to life with real people and real parties. And so it just kind of built on itself. And then the brand exploded out of the UK, swung back around to the US. And we've, I've had the same team on this brand now since 99. No one ever leaves my company because I have too much dirt on him. No, but, um, <laughs> but you know, we, we've been with Grant Snap for 28 years and a lot of my employees have been with me for, uh, for over 25 years. So, uh, and I think, I think that we always say we're, we're like the Rolling Stones when we go into a client, like we just know what to fucking do. Right. And, uh, we can fix your brand if it's broken. We can create something new if it's not, if, if, if you need that, but we just know how to perform together because we've been doing it so mm. long. And and I think one of the key things with Hendrix that makes it so successful and so unique is um, is the incredible consistency of the brand has allowed it to keep growing and and getting weirder and weirder, right? Mm. And uh, of course, none of this would be possible without the incredible uh, liquid that Leslie Gracie makes. She she created the liquid and she's, you know, head distiller and people... People are attracted to the brand world, attracted to the bottle, but they stay for the liquid. And that's always the way it should be, Mm. right? So I've talked too much. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sorry. No, no, that's good. I I think people don't know like all the creative things that go into marketers, right? Like you said, this book isn't meant to be a a book on like how to one, two, three, fix your business in a marketing effort, right? It's to really tell that story and that that stream of consciousness that you talked about, right. And trying to show, uh, yeah. you know, how that kind of comes to life and how you're trying to get a consumer to just pick up the bottle and then let the liquid sell itself on the back end. Yeah. But we always say, so there's three things that, that every brand has to have. Okay. Mm. Every, every booze brand, you have to have great packaging, great story and great liquid. And they all need to work together. Mm. And you'd be surprised how often that doesn't happen. Mm. You'd be surprised that liquid development does their own thing. They hire a different packaging firm for for the bottle, and then they hire a marketing agency to do the advertising. And what we do that's really different is like, no, we do everything. And now we even do liquid development because we have our own, uh, you know, distilling and uh, we have a staff, we have biochemists on staff, we have all this, you know, we have mixologists on staff, we have everything. But I think like the... Who's the book for? The book is for, um, if you own a craft distillery, craft brewery, winery, or you're in the spirits business in any way, any capacity, whether it's distilling, marketing, it, it's an amazing, you know, it, it might reaffirm what you already think you know, but I guarantee what it's going to do is challenge your thinking and it's going to help your brand lift itself out of obscurity. And it's going to make you look at uh what you're creating and marketing through a very different lens. And if you're just a creative person, it's also a a guide to how to live a more creative life in in general. So you don't have to be in the spirits business to to read the book. 
But um, if you are, it's it'll it'll make you a million bucks. Okay, guaranteed. <laughs> Put guaranteed. That on. Yeah. Guaranteed. It's worked for me. <laughs> yes. There you go. The the interesting thing that I found about the book was when I started reading it, you started talking about you know putting your phone down, putting down TikTok, yeah. putting down Instagram, yeah. putting putting down all these things, and. And I'm like, well, if, we, if he's doing all this and he's not paying attention to this, well, how is he staying relevant? But as the book progresses, you learn how your mind works. And it's you look at historical things and you try to bring that, I guess, to the forefront in ways that might seem obscure. But at, at the end of the day, they end up making a lot of sense for certain brands, You're, new brands and, and historical brands. You can only create you, your creations are only as good as your source material. And your source material, if it's TikTok, what you're creating is going to be boring because it's what everyone else is doing. So that's why I say drop everything, read stuff no one else is reading, like dig into old weird shit. Like uh, I read a lot, right? Um, but it could be watching, like don't watch what's on Netflix, like watch old movies. And it's about mashing together different ideas. Aaron, you might like have a, I don't know, have spending all this time talking to me, you might have a, a way of distilling it. Well, no, I mean, he's right. You know, I, I think a good example right now is, you know, you, you saw that super viral clip of the um, Game of Thrones actors talking about the Negroni Spagliato. Have you seen that meme? Steve hasn't seen that meme because he doesn't open TikTok. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> this is this is going viral right now. And I swear I've gotten 10 pitches this week about brands trying to riff off of this thing. Yeah. Well, Steve's never seen it, so he's not going to do a dumb riff off of it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, by the time I'd gotten my fifth pitch about, you know, the Game of Thrones Negroni Spagliato meme riff, I said, you know, what are you trying to do? You're just trying to ride the coattails of a trend that, yes. you know, by the time this episode airs 10 days from when we're talking, no one's going to even be knowing what I'm talking about because the meme's already uh, going to go away. You know, what Steve does is, is draw from the past. And it doesn't even matter if you know the reference he's drawing from the past. It's, it's kind of time-tested stuff that has inspired people for a very long time, you know, like apothecary bottles that he talked about and reviving it in the future as a sort of mashup. You know, I think one of the smartest things Steve ever you know, said to me is, you know, he wants to create stuff that people don't know when it's created. So yeah. if you talk to most people, if you talk to people that, you know, Hendrix Gen might be their favorite spirit. And they say, oh, no, a guy, a guy didn't create that in 1999. It's, you know, it was created in England in the 1800s. No, it wasn't. But that's intentional in the way he creates uh, things, which I think is very interesting mm. to create stuff that you want to be timeless as opposed to just copying whatever crap is on TikTok or Instagram right now. We always say we make things ugly on purpose. And mm. what we mean by that is if you do it right, you can't tell when it was created, as Aaron just said. So, mm. um, and, and ugly doesn't mean it's ugly. What ugly means is that it's... Um, off trend. It's authentic to itself, not authentic to a trend. Okay. And that's very important, especially, you know, in the Kentucky uh, with uh, bourbon world is, um, is, and, and there's a difference between it. Like, how do you make something authentic, feel authentic without making it feel granny panties? Right. Mm. <laughs> and nobody wants old shit, but what they want is authentic stuff. And there's a real art form or a trick to making something feel uh, old yet vital and new at the same time. And that's, that's, you only get that by practice. Like you can't just take an old graphic, put it on a bottle and expect it to work. It needs to have like all this other shit going into it that, that makes it really uh, cool. So a big influence, and this also comes through in the book loud and clear, I think, is that I was really influenced by bands music and i've always been intrigued like when i was a kid that you would carve the name of your favorite band on your on your desk or, or on your notebook we get a tattoo of metallica but nobody wants a tattoo of heinz ketchup right um so but what why are we so loyal to bands but 
brands are not that way. And I've always set out to like, like Sailor Jerry was purposely set up to be like, a, I wanted to be like the coolest band that ever was, right? Mm. So it was, it was the punk rock Captain Morgan is what we, simple idea behind it. So, you know, and it's always about the mashup. So this is what it gets into, like when you don't just take old stuff. So if we had just taken Sailor Jerry, just taken the tattoos of Norman Collins and done nothing else with it, it would have done okay, but then we added the the punk rock soundtrack and all the garage bands that used to, you know, and sometimes there were huge bands like, you know, um, Reverend Horton Heat or uh, the Buzzcocks or whatever would come to, come and visit us. Um, but we added a whole soundtrack to it. And so it becomes this like mashup of like old and new and this whole weird thing that you can't even explain, right? And... Um, and that's always the key to our brands. Like, like they've got this certain what the fuck factor to them that you don't know. Like, how did you come up with that? Well, you come up with that by having interesting esoteric sources of material behind it that you're not getting, that you're not following what everyone else is doing. You're kind of mashing together shit that you know that no one else knows. Mm. Okay. It's like soup. You're making a soup. You're making a, uh, you're like, you're like a chef. You're like adding a little pinch of that a little bit of that, you're stirring it just long enough and then you put it out there and that's the way a band creates a song, yeah. right? So a really good band, bands don't make any sense. You know, like, I'm trying to think like a good example, like fucking Jethro Tull, right? He was like, played a flute and sang about like uh, medieval shit, right? <laughs> With heavy metal stuff. So the whole thing doesn't make any sense, but, but it's really cool. Yeah. But that's the way a good brand needs to work is it, it, it shouldn't make any sense. Mm. And that's why it's like, sometimes it's hard if you're um, a very, the more, the more you went to a business school, the more, you, the more you have an MBA, the more it might be hard to work with me because you want to see things through a prism of, of logic. Mm. And I always say like with research and testing, feel free to test the shit out of what I've come up with, but do not use research to come up with the product. Use research to test the magic. Mm. So, so put it out there and say, and you, I guarantee you'll say, people will say, wow, this is cool. I like it. But if you ask them what they want, and you hear many examples of this, like I think uh, Henry Ford and, and uh, Steve Jobs always said stuff like, don't ever ask a consumer what they want. They have no idea what they want until they see it. Right. Yeah. But that's kind of the same with all of this stuff is that create something magical and, and mystical and crazy and people will find it and they'll be loyal to it hmm. and, and, uh, and they'll be loyal to it forever. Yeah. I find all this fascinating and I want to go back to one point because I feel like it kind of ties into this, like kind of all together is when brands are creating, like you part, you, you broke it down to three pieces. And that second one is the story. Right. And, yeah. and like Go to you first, then back to Steve. I, I think this is really interesting. So like there's a variety of new brands that pop up every day, right? And you get to see them as just as much as we do, if not more, right? And so they kind of try to figure out how to take this sourced material, sampled material, right? To get into your band methodology here and try to create it their own, right? Like when you see that and you kind of can, can pick through it from a journalistic perspective, like... How does that take your view on a, on a brand from a journalistic perspective uh, and you try to see like all these people trying to create the story and you're trying to tell, you know, people about that. And then from a marketer's perspective, Steve, after that, like, how would you go about creating these kind of riff on brands or these samples of other people's whiskey to create brands? So it's kind of a two part question. One to Aaron, one to one to Steve. Well, I think you're teeing us up for, <laughs> for something pretty good that I'll let Steve tell you about. But uh, yeah, you know, it's very challenging. It, you know, I think we have a chapter called in our book, like, you know, don't start a new bourbon brand or something. I forget what it's called. But, you know, bourbon's a very narrow thing you can create. It has to be corn, corn based and aged in new charred oak barrels. So, so with thousands of products on the market with, you know, seven or eight conglomerates that have, you know, millions of barrels aging in their warehouses that already taste good with an economy of scale that they can price well, you know, with, with teams in New York, Chicago, and Louisville, you know, how, how could you be so arrogant to start a new bourbon brand and think there's any way 
you could you could get cut through the, the surface and, and and get on these things. Maybe you could start you know something else, but but bourbon it seems very ambitious. So yeah, you know obviously I get dozens of new bourbon brands pitching me all the time, and there's almost nothing that sets them apart, especially if they're sourcing liquid, which most are these days, mm. you know, and, and they know all the, the buzzwords, they're going to scratch the itch of collectors, single barrel, cast strength, you know, non-chill filtered, private picks, all that stuff. And that will work to a certain degree. You know, there's such a thirst for bourbon right now, but, you know, let's check back in five years and see how many of these brands still exist because they're not really brands. They're just, you know, getting things out on the market. But we say don't start a bourbon brand with source liquid, but I'll pass it to Steve and he can. Ah, he can yeah. Okay. There. Okay. So uh, <laughs> wait, I was, was going to go a little further on this because, you know, we say this and then outside of bourbon, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, um, then the rock starts Terramana and it's the fastest growing thing in, in history. Right. Or, sure. uh, but so the exceptions to the rule are, okay, you can start a brand and where your liquid is, you know, I, I think Terramana is probably like inferior liquid or good enough, right? So, okay, but you have the rock. And so you've got something, some, some, like, so if you have the rock, maybe I don't need differentiated liquid or whatever. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, or the other thing you could do is like, okay, I'm, I'm uh, Global Spirits Megacorp and I'm going to launch a competitively priced uh, something to beat Bullet. And it doesn't need to be that different because I have the world's best sales force and I can reduce the price and I can call Total Wine and get a lock-in, right? So, like, I can do that. But if you're a craft guy or you're a guy starting out, you know, what are you going to do? So you've got to have something that makes all three happen. Your liquid needs to be differentiated. Your story needs to be differentiated. And your... um packaging needs to be differentiated and you better, but then you also better have your, have yourself figured out in terms of uh, so many of these craft distillers expand too quickly, uh, run out of resources because they've gone to too many markets and they don't, they naively think that the distributors are going to actually do what they say they're going to do and they don't have to do anything. And, you know, there's lots of things like that. So that's why I think, you know, the book is really important because we go through all this about what you, what you need to do to really uh, overcome that. And still, Still, you're probably fucked, but no, not really. I mean, you're just kind of like, there's a lot of things again, adding up against you. So you've got to have everything working on all cylinders for it to work. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, whatever, whatever your best shot is, this way you need to buy 10 copies of the book and give them to everyone who works for you or works with you or knows you. I'm just kidding, but I'm deadly serious. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, because, like, because the business schools won't be, uh, putting this on their must read list right uh, well they should they, they should, should. Really. they should yeah i mean that's your I'll argument we on the business school over here well so it's really interesting right because it's not just that like that we so we talked about like the marketing piece and like people sourcing liquid and, and creating these brands but it's also like uh, a lot of these brands that are sourcing liquid the another thing that you talk about like in the, like i think it's the last chapter is this idea of like whiskey metals and like how they, they how they don't <laughs> matter too right like you yeah. So like you try to use like uh, an educated guess, someone tasting your liquid blindly to really, you know, deliver clout to your, to your whiskey. Like, you know, I find that really interesting. Like just that I was just kind of flipping through and and reading like little sections here as as we're talking, like that one just kind of caught my eye because everyone's like, oh, I got double gold at San Francisco. I'm the world's best whiskey now. Well, it's funny too about that because... You got double gold at San Francisco, yet you bought a sourced whiskey that five other brands are using the same liquid. So I don't know what that's saying. Anyway, um, we, we don't enter award shows. I don't, um, I'm, I'm personally very opposed to them. And that started in the ad business. I couldn't stand the Addies or the Clios. So we never entered. And when we got into the spirits business, I think we entered the first year San Francisco thing and we won a, double gold for our beet whiskey um, and it got best of show or something like that. And, and I was like, all right, we don't, we're not doing this again. It was like, take that money and create something else. But speaking of, so we kind of thought it'd be funny to um, 
to do exactly what the book tells you not to do. So the book says, don't start another bourbon brand with sourced whiskey. So we decided to start one <laughs> as, a, as kind of a troll. And the amazing thing is, okay, so the brand's called Dunce. Dunce Whiskey. Like a Dunce D-U-N-C- D-U-N-C-E is like Dunce Cap, right? And the amazing thing is we used all of the principles in the book to create the whiskey. And that started with finding mystical and esoteric source material. So do you know the, do you know the true history of the Dunce Cap? Of course you don't. Of course you don't. Okay, so I'll tell you. John, John Duns lived in the 1200s in Scotland. And John Duns was considered the smartest man in the world at the time. And this dude, all, he had all these followers called Dunsmen, okay? And they all wore pointy conical hats. Why do they wear pointy conical hats? Because he believed in pyramid power, that the, the uh, conical hat would channel Div- energy from divine energy straight into your into your skull and this was the source of his incredible intelligence so duns was so smart that it made the pope jealous so what did the pope do buried the motherfucker alive okay for for real and started a campaign to change the meaning of the duns cap from being intelligent to being one of stupidity. So we were like, holy shit, that's a really fun story. And the reason we came out with Dunce, the chapter that talks about not making your own brand, we have this incredible, beautiful uh, visual that the, our Hendrix designer created with a Dunce cap over a glass of whiskey. I thought that'd be a great brand. So we decided to take the story of John Dunce, but we took it further. So we bought sourced whiskey from Indiana like everyone else does, brought it back, and we took those barrels and we created these giant dunce caps, like massive, that fit over, over the, uh, the heads of the barrels. So our barrel house was full of barrels with these giant red dunce caps, and we kept the dunce caps on the barrels for six months. And wouldn't you know it, it totally transformed the taste of the whiskey. So instead of it being, you know, just your average, you know, great liquid from, a, you know, a, a four-year-old bourbon from um, Indiana, right? Suddenly it's transformed into this, this mo- like, this is like Pappy Van Winkle shit, right? Because of the conical hats. So no joke for real. Well, it sounds like you have created a great story. You have now exceptional liquid because of your hat. And, the hat. I'm, and I'm sure as hell, you're going to have some hell of a packaging. when it's, it's, it's stupendous. And I'm telling you, the entire country is going to be. So when you buy a bottle, you get a guns cap too. And um, <laughs> all of the, uh, when we sell it in, all of the bartenders, mixologists get dunce caps, the uh, store clerks. So, we're, it's a red wave. Not that way. The dunce caps are red. I just, I'm not political. It's um, it, the dunce caps. Everyone's getting a dunce cap. It says dunce on the front. It's um, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be quite a sight. It is. And and uh, just to call out the chapter and or the little subheading in the book. This is not what this book is for in subtext, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. Just just FYI so, for so everyone. You don't want to listen. So you don't want to listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you refuse to listen offended. to me and want to create yet another sourced bourbon brand. <laughs> so but, I but this one has the magical qualities of the dunce cap. So I, I shouldn't be offended when uh, I get the mail on Saturday and open up a package and it has dunce caps all over it. Right. And that's right. Uh, right. No, no, no. It's what the book's media is, kit. That's, that's the book's exactly. media kit for those exactly. that are listening. It's littered with dunce caps. So uh, yep. that's very crafty. <laughs> yes. So as you can tell, like, just for our listeners here, like, as you all can tell, like this book's got a lot of content and a lot of, you know, I'd say girth to it. Cause it's just, it's, there's a lot here to, to take in and, and a lot of fun, right? I think what you learn is, and just having this conversation is brand making is 
tedious and strenuous, but it's also a lot of fun along the way, right? Like you're creating something for people to enjoy. And and that's there's a lot of hard work in that. But like as you sit back and kind of look at the work you've done and and the the quality of content you've put out, like do you ever sit back and be like, yeah, we we did that. Like, or do you kind of like, hey, we can't rest on our laurels and we're always trying to push to to make these brands continue to be better. Oh, obviously we're always striving to, to do better. And, and just, uh, we, we have a lot of fun. And I think the key is we don't, the more fucked up we make it, when I say fucked up, what I mean is like art, arty or conceptual or we, we try to uh, go beyond boundaries is um, the more we do that, the more money we seem to make, right? And we're having so much fun up in Tamworth, like, we made our the whiskey with the beaver anal gland, right? The uh, beaver castorium. We made a. Uh, we just had our the crab, uh, green crab whiskey. We just came out with went went crazy viral. Like it was on Colbert. It was a. It's on every. I think we got something like thirty two million dollars worth of press on that. And and it's like, yeah, it made money. But the more point of it was to to make art. Okay, so when I say make art, it's like. The, per, the first purpose is creativity, but there's a commercial sense to it, but, the, but the, it makes money because it's creative, mm. right? And I think we have like really, it's funny because my background historically is uh, Pennsylvania Dutch, lots of Mennonites in my family. And it's funny, we've been working with the grand family for 28 years because I, I don't know who's, who's more thrifty, Mennonites or... Um, Scotsman. So, uh, we've, we've been, we know how to, we know how to do a lot with very little. Okay. Yeah. So we've been doing this podcast for about 200 episodes. Now we're coming up on our 200th episode release and we've seen a lot of press releases and it's crazy that we've kind of come full circle here because we, we actually have you on the podcast, but the press releases that we get about some of your, your whiskeys at Tamworth have been one of those like what what the fuck, <laughs> what yeah. The fuck? Yeah. yeah exactly yeah. you know like the venison whiskey like whiskey made with with deer red deer and uh like you said that anal glands of a beaver yeah yeah um you know and what now, and now the crab is, one yeah it's just like it's all come from how we our employees so long right because it's not just a job it's an adventure isn't that the army or something um but it, you come to work and you have no idea what you're going to work on next, mm. right? And now with the marketing company, marketing other things, Quaker City, we get the best briefs from all over the world. We work with the, you know, the, the best budgets, the best people, and um, it's really exciting. And then we always say, okay, there's two, I, I want to say this artist named Doug Aiken who became really famous but he had two portfolios. One was called bread and one was called butter. Bread was what he did for money. Butter was what he did for, for art. And when you do, sooner or later, if you do the butter part, sooner or later, the butter makes more money than the bread. Mm. Because your, your, it's not going to say your intentions are pure, but you have a creative spirit that doesn't get tired or beaten down because you're not doing like, mind-numbing work right and and i think the crazy stuff we do like the crab trapper all of my clients are like do what do that for me how do you do that i want one of those right so you started like and, and sometimes you even when you send the crab trapper out to people like you and it's like what was one like we don't we don't we're not doing anything on flavored whiskey somebody said I'm like, oh, fuck off. You know, we're, you know, so we also make really good, like, like, like we make a really good um, bourbon, Old Man on the Mountain, make a really good rye. We make a really good, um, really, really, probably one of the best brandies in the country, Tamworth Garden brandy. So we make legit stuff, but we also have a lot of fun. And I heard your gins are pretty good too. Our gins are amazing. I think, I think we have the best gin program in the country. I really do, but I'm biased. Jake, are you ready for a road trip? Yeah, ready for a road trip. 
I uh the the northeast is is calling my name. Um, you should they should come up. Make sure you come in the right season because during uh you just miss peak leaf season in Tamworth, but um it's a sight to behold. Yeah, no, I, I think it's all interesting because like you know whiskey's supposed to be fun. Whiskey's supposed to bring people together. Brands are supposed to do that, make iconic statements and and things that that make you want to be a part of them, right? I was listening to something just about like, you know, about on like how Apple has created the brand that people are just so loyal to it. They don't want to leave right. it. Right. Like that's what you're doing with these, you know, drinkers and, you know, people that you engage with the brand, you're making it to where they don't want to leave. Right. They want it's to like a band. Again, it's like a band. Yeah. It's like the dead, the grateful dead or, or any band that you are really loyal. You want to be part of everything the band is doing because it becomes a community and mm. it becomes a place that you want to be. Yep. And that's, that's the lesson. This is, I think there's a book out called everything I learned from marketing. I learned from dead. And, um, but it's true. And it's like, um, and a, a big influence in the book is a guy named Steve McLaren. Sorry. It's Philly's happening outside. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody probably got shot anyway. Um, it's authentic, right? It sure is. It's getting more authentic by the day. Um, but Steve McLaren was, uh, he, um, he's the guy behind the Sex Pistols and Adam Ant and Baba Wow. And uh, I don't know, he's, he's probably the most biggest influence on my career because I always thought it was amazing. Like, look at Adam, Adam and the Ants. I don't know if you guys are probably not, I'm 58, so this is eighties, you know, but I also like, okay, Adam Ant saying about pirates, cowboys and, and, um, Indians. And he had like, the you know, it was punk rock. It was like a total mashup of the weirdest stuff. And I feel like, I always thought like, well, what's so interesting about Adam and the Ants or Bow Wow Wow was like how there were these like crazy mashups. And the other thing is they, they, were more like fashion and I, and I feel like a good brand is also like it's, it's equal parts rock and like band equal parts. Like it still needs to be fashion. And I don't mean like woman in a sultry, like pose with a, you know, blank face. I mean more like it reaches out to you on a visceral level, an emotional level, not necessarily a logical level. And I think, a lot of work in the whiskey category, particularly American bourbons, it's just, you know, beards and barrels and talking about how old your, your, you know, your, your stuff is or what it was aged in. And that's, that, that works to a degree, but, but for something to really break through and make that lasting impression and statement it needs to work on, a, on a, an entirely different level. And that's, that's where the mysticism comes in. And lesson number eight, turn your brand into a cult. Yes. Something that people are going to follow. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. See what, you, do see what you're right. doing. Yes. And they'll stick with you. And that's why, you know, you notice on Hendrix, we have the whole cabinet of curiosities, which is, um, we're, we're coming out with all these new variants and ideas because you've got your core audience that, that loves you, that was there from the beginning, you need to keep giving them some new, some new stuff to play with. Mm. And what it does, it feeds, it feeds the loyalty. And mm. that's what we're doing up in Tamworth is we're just coming out with lots of fun new stuff just to, to keep everybody talking. Yeah. And that, that's how you turn things into a cult. That's what a band does. Band releases a new single or dance mix or whatever. Yeah. Right? What did Madonna say? All press is good press? Uh, I think that was Oscar Wilde, but yes. Yeah. Well, she, she, she reframed it. <laughs> I thought you should see a Madonna lately. I think, I think she's crossed the, into bad press. <laughs> <laughs> oh man no this i think this conversation could probably go on for about five hours because it, it's just so interesting all the stories you have and all the, the work you all have put into it so i i would be remiss if i didn't ask you all just to share where can they find the book where can people uh pick it up over the next uh, couple weeks as as uh, launch day is here right around the corner aaron take it away literally every place you can buy books Jenna. Any place you buy books, big and small, it'll be there. It'll be in 
stores big and small. Uh, we're currently offering a deal before launch day. If you buy 100 copies, you can get a personal branding consultation from the man himself, Steve Grass, um, which I think is an absolutely incredible offer. This is not something he typically does. So, uh, you know, you're starting a brand. You want some tips from the booze maven himself. Uh, get 100 copies. That sounds like a really good investment. I, I yeah. would think so. If you're, if you're, uh, if you got a brand it needs, um, just buy a hundred books and I'll be there. I'm sure, I'm sure the, the math equaled, equaled out, right? <laughs> yeah. No, it's an incredible bargain because I'm really expensive these days. Yeah. Well, really appreciate your all's time today. Grab the book. It's super interesting. It keeps me engaged and I'm not a, not a super reader. So Aaron, great job. Like, getting the content together. And Steve, thank you for sharing all your stories with us because I think it's a valuable lesson. You know, we, we are marketers in our own way from, um, you know, the podcasting world. And it just, I think it's going to make us better at what we do. And so I, I really appreciate you all just spending uh, an hour here with us to talk about, you know, the upcoming book and, and we wish you nothing but success uh, on the launch. Great. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bourbon Lens. Again, Aaron and Steve, thank you so much. Uh, you can find the book Brand Mysticism out everywhere here in the next week or so. So be on the lookout for it. As always, go over to your favorite podcast listening app, hit subscribe, hit the five-star review and drop a comment. Go over to bourbonlens.com, completely redesign, new reviews, new bourbon content, weekly, daily. Uh, we're trying to do the damn thing. And lastly, keep up with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Bourbon Lens. And until next time, cheers. Cheers. Thank you so much. Talk yeah. soon.